Dear Lord, we love you, Jesus, and uh, I'm so excited for your word this morning, God, just because you, you, God, you, it's amazing to think that you ordained this time, God, that you know exactly where we are in our lives, you know uh, what's going on, you know where we've been and where we're headed, and Lord, we just, we just, God, we want the faith to trust you. We want to have faith to to know, God, that you want, you desire the best for us. But Lord, sometimes we just want to do it our own way, and Lord, ultimately we don't want to do it our own way because we know the results. And so, just this morning we ask you to minister to our hearts, God, in a way that no uh, philosophy or uh, worldview, nothing like that is going to straighten us out, Lord. We need you to do the work that we can't do. God, the inside work, God, is in our heart, Lord, it's not something that we can fix, that we can't strive to, to be better. Lord, we just, uh, if we strive in, in anything, it's just to know you more. If we strive in anything, God, it's to surrender to you more. And we just ask that you do that work in us this morning. We love you, Jesus. Open your word to us. And we pray for our country. We pray for our president. <clears throat> we pray for our local leader. We thank you for the freedom you've given us. <clears throat> God, we pray for all the churches that are making choices and having to determine what to do in this time, God, as they're being told in California to shut their doors. And it's just amazing times that we live in, God, that we get to see these things happen that, man, we would have never dreamed of even three months ago, six months ago. But God, we know you're coming soon. And until then, God, we just ask that you would use us, help us to redeem the time and to glorify you in everything that we do, Lord. Fill us this morning, God. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, you guys remember... I didn't know, there, I always forgot there was a guy in the Bible, his name was Jason. But in the book of Acts, we don't really know much about him, but he had a Bible study in his house. And it's really cool because through that whole Bible study, they were kind of in a situation where we're at now, you know, they were hiding and stuff out in church, you know. Uh, actually, it was way worse than that, but uh, it was awesome because that's how it always is, is when the enemy comes against what God's doing, what God's doing grows, right? It's just amazing. And that's what I think we'll probably see in our country. We're gonna see great things in these end times um, as the enemy presses harder. Because yeah, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Greater is he that is in you, that is in the world, right? Greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. And so, we should be excited for the things that we're gonna see Jesus. But Jason, he had a little Bible study going. I remember he was accused of just the uh, Pharisees and them. They are like, man, they're turning the world upside down for Jesus. That was in the book of Acts. And, but really, they're turning the world up, right side up for Jesus is really what it is. And uh, when you think of the kingdom of this world, God's kingdom is not here and now. Sometimes we hear it, we sing songs like that, but yes, we are saved. Yes, God is in us. This is not his kingdom. Because his kingdom is opposite than this kingdom. Our kingdom is upside down. And when I was in the military, uh, you know, it was amazing because in God's kingdom, the greatest is always the servant of all, right? But in our kingdom here on earth, it's uh, the opposite. It's like, who can you climb over to get to the top, basically? And you're basically trained to do that from a little kid, you know? It's just survival of the fittest or whatever. But um, in the military, I think they really, I learned that if there was a possible way to actually love people the way you're supposed to love, 
and put people first the way we're supposed to put people first, the Army really has it down in, on paper. <laughs> but not in reality, it doesn't happen. But, uh, and so I wanted to read just a little portion. This, this, this blessed me when I was in the military. I was like, man, whoever wrote these things, like this is just part of the creed for a soldier, for a NCO, I just got the end of it. Um, just a little piece out of it. But just imagine if this is what was really taking place, not just in the army, but even in our world. Speaking of leaders, it says all soldiers are entitled to outstanding leadership, and I will provide that leadership. I know my soldiers, and I, so I know my soldiers. I know every one of them. I know them personally. I will always place their needs above my own. I will communicate con consistently with my soldiers, keeping consistent communication. I'll never leave them uninformed. I will be fair and impartial when recommending both rewards and punishment. Officers of my unit will have maximum time to accomplish their duties. So not only those below you, but those that are above you. They will have maximum time to accomplish their duties. They will not have to accomplish mine. I will earn their respect and confidence as well as that of my soldiers, those above me and those below me. I will be loyal to those with whom I serve, seniors, peers, and subordinates alike. I will exercise initiative by taking appropriate action in the absence of orders. Integrity, right? I will not compromise my integrity, nor my moral courage. I will not forget, nor will I allow my comrades to forget that we are professionals, non-commissioned officers, leaders. <laughs> um, but isn't that amazing? Like when you read that, I'm like, man, this is like if we could, like, it's not that man doesn't know what to do, it's just doing what we know we need to do is the problem, right? Mm -hmm. And so this kingdom over here on earth, this is not <coughs> God's kingdom. Yes, God's kingdom is coming, but when it does, we're going to have a thousand year reign on earth, and that will be his kingdom. But right now, we're not in his kingdom, we're foreigners. But uh, Jason and them, they were turning the world right side up. And as we look this morning, we're picking up in John chapter 13, verses 4 through 17 is what we're covering. And as we just ended last week, remember, it's right before Jesus' crucifixion. And it's at the Last Supper. And so Jesus has a lot in his mind. He knows what's just around the corner. And so there's, if you're taking notes, there's three things that we're going to see. I can, this is how I broke this down um, into three sections, basically. That uh, Number one, Jesus is going to be illustrating salvation. We'll see that in verses four through six. Jesus illustrating salvation. Jesus is displaying justification and sanctification. So he's going to be displaying justification and sanctification in verses 6 through 12. And then the last portion, verses 4 through 6, Jesus uh, is going to be, or verses 13 through 17, Jesus is going to be leading by example. So we'll see those three things, Jesus illustrating salvation and displaying justification and sanctification and then leading by example. And that's basically how it's broken down in this section of scripture that we're gonna go through. Well, we ended last week with three things as well, where Jesus, we knew that he brought some things with him to the cross. It was what he knew. He knew everything that the Father had given him. He knew everything that he had received from the Father. He was able to bring that with him. He knew that he came from God he knew who, who he was in his glory even before the heavens and the world existed. He created all things. But not only that, but Jesus knew that he was returning to God. He knew where he was going. Right? And we looked at our lives and we were like, man, if I can just know what I received from God, if I would just know who I am in Christ, like who I am in Christ, and then not only that, but if I would just remember and know where I'm going, right? Those things we can bring with us, right? And we look at Jesus, and that's where we got those things. 
what we're picking up today in verse 4 through 17. I'm just going to read it. We'll read through it first. It's pretty short. And speaking of Jesus, after he basically shared these things with the disciples, it says he rose from supper. Verse 4, he laid aside his garments, he took a towel, and he girded himself. <clears throat> after that, he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel which he was girding. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. And Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Just give me a bath, right? Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one that would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, he had taken his garments and he sat down again. And he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. And you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And so, it's the Last Supper. Everything is not quite as wholesome and pretty as the picture might look that you see up on the wall, right, of the Last Supper. Uh, actually, if you can see hearts, things are pretty dirty, right? The disciples are sitting around and they're trying to figure out, like, who's going to be the greatest. And while that's happening, in that same moment, we have one of them plotting with Satan, right? He's preparing to betray Jesus. And then all of them came in and their feet are dirty, man, because they've just been walking around, you know, and there was always one person that was the servant that would wash the feet of those when they came in. Well, for whatever reason, and I don't know why, but the disciples, nobody did it this time. So they all came in, and, uh, and they kind of leaned around. It was like a, not like a dinner table like what we have, right? They like lay around and eat, you know, but they were together around this little table. But their feet were filthy. And so Jesus is going to illustrate in verses 4 through 6, we're going to see salvation. And so look as we watch this. John is writing these things, and it's so cool. It's like it happened yesterday for him. And you can tell because the way he writes, it's like really short description. He's going to describe, like really short in detail, Jesus did this, and he did this, and he did this, and he did this. So he starts off in verse 4. He says, He rose from supper and he laid aside his garments. He took a towel, he girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin. He began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. So he rose from supper. If you look at John, turn to John chapter 10, we're going to look at verses 17 and 18. John chapter 10, 17 and 18. John 10, 17 and 18. This is what it says. Jesus speaking, Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself, I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. And so Jesus here is saying exactly what it sounds like. He is doing 
No one else is doing this. This is not the Jews or technically uh, the Romans that are crucifying him. Really, Jesus is the one surrendering himself, right? He lays down his life to take it again. So when we read this, he rose from supper. And so Jesus gets up from supper because nobody cleaned the feet. And he's going to do something. He's going to do something that's going to represent salvation. Well, he is the one that has to do it because Jesus is the only one that can save us from our sin, right? He truly is the only one that can really wash us. And so he says he rose up, and then what? He laid aside his garments. So when you think of the garments, what did Jesus come and lay aside when he came? He didn't lay aside the fact that he's deity, but he laid aside the glory of being God, right? The glory, if he was in the glory of actually being God when he was here on earth, he wouldn't have been crucified. He wouldn't have been a baby and wearing a diaper and all of those things. You know, he would be perfect, right? But he became a human and added humanity. So he laid, in a sense, he laid aside his garments and he took on ours, right? The, he took on flesh, like John says. John, John 1 and 1, right? The word was with us among us, right? In verse 14, the flesh dwelt among us, right? Jesus is the, the word, but he put on man's, our flesh. In Philippians 2, 5 through 8, I like the NIV version, how it reads. It just, I like the way it reads. It says, in your relationships with one another, this is Jesus speaking again. Um, in, or this is Paul speaking, but he's speaking about Jesus. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in very nature God, he was God, he is God. He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and he, by becoming obedient to death, even the death of a cross. I just think of like before we get out and go somewhere, uh, the girls are putting makeup on, or you know the guys are brushing their hair, or whatever. You know, it's all about how you appear before people, right? Well, it's so interesting that Jesus, when he got ready to come to Earth, what did he do? He became a human. It says, being found in the appearance as man. That is a lot different than being found in the appearance of God. So he humbled himself, and he took on our nature, it says. He took our nature, the nature of a servant. And then it says he took a towel and he girded himself. So he wrapped himself in this towel. And girded it means to tie it around. So he tied it all the way around him. He wrapped himself in flesh, our flesh, humanity, right? In 2 Corinthians 8, 9, it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Jesus laid down everything so that we would be rich. He wrapped himself in our humanity. And what was he bearing in that humanity? He's bearing our sin on the cross, right? And then it says he poured water into a basin. So Jesus poured himself out for you and for me. We know this. Isaiah 53, 4 through 12, it says this. Surely, speaking of Jesus, this is Isaiah 53 before the crucifixion. This is amazing. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him as stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. 
and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord, this is amazing, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his, land, in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, verse 12, I will divide him a portion with the great, speaking of Jesus, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And so that right there is a prophecy. Of, that's like God speaking of his son through Isaiah, of when he would wrap himself in humanity and take on all of our sin and all of our iniquity and all of our filth. And it pleased the Father because Jesus was going to wash us. And so Jesus began to wash the feet of the disciples it says that he, he began to wipe them with the towel, in verse uh, 5. Wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So now that towel that he had wrapped himself with, that, that was representing our, his flesh, him becoming human, the incarnation, he's now using that towel to wipe them. And so as he's doing that, this is the act that we're watching of Jesus. This is the act of salvation in a sense. It's a picture of our salvation. Jesus is the one doing the action. The disciples aren't washing their own feet. Jesus is the one doing it. And the action of washing is being done. How was it done? Jesus took his human flesh. He offered his body up for the penalty of all of our sin. It was his flesh that paid the price. Our sins were wiped away at every whip, man, when he was flogged and it hit his back and they turned it, twisted it, and it clasped the skin and then they pulled it back and <clears throat> back and they ripped off chunks of the skin. It was a wiping away of the flesh. So as Jesus is wiping away the dirt off these disciples' feet, it's like I can see Jesus' skin being wiped off, just wiped away like it's nothing. But it's our sin it was being ripped from his body. And many people believe that the blows were so brutal that it even exposed parts of his insides. But his flesh had to be ripped and torn <laughs> to wipe away all of our sin. So when we read that over, verses 4 and 5, just as a whole, because this is what did take place, but you can't help but to see this picture that Jesus is showing us this, this illustration of salvation. Verse 4, John 13, 4 and 5. He rose from supper, he laid aside his garments, he took a towel and girded himself. And after that he poured water into a basin. He began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And so Jesus had told his disciples earlier that this was going to happen. He was preparing them for what was coming. He told them, he said, you know, this is what I'm going to do to save you. He told them in Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, verse 17. Turn to Matthew 20, verse 17. 17 to 19. Matthew 20, 17 to 19. It says, now Jesus going up to Jerusalem 
he took the 12 disciples aside on the road. And this is what he said. He said, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. But in the third day he will rise again. That's amazing. Jesus told them that. All of that before it happened. That the third day he would rise again after the wiping away of all their sin. And now that we're justified by the blood of Jesus, we're still walking in this world because we're living in this, and this is not his kingdom yet. So our feet get dirty, right? We're walking around, but we're justified. You're already forgiven if you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sin, you're saved. But we still get dirty. Our feet get dirty. We all get dirty, all of us. In the next section of the scripture, Jesus is going to display, he's going to show, using Peter, justification and sanctification. And this is important because we need to know this in our walk with God in order to think properly whenever we're dealing with our own sin. In chapter, uh, same chapter 13, verses 6 through 10, Jesus is going to display justification and sanctification. In verse 6 he says, Then he came to Simon Peter. So he's washing them, and he gets to Simon Peter. Peter says, Lord, you're, you, you're washing my feet? Like, no way. And Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now. What you will know after this. And Peter said, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, then you have no part with me. And then Peter said, Lord, then not just my feet. Give me a bath, you know, wash my hands, wash my head. And Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but but is completely clean. And you are clean but not all of you. And so, Jesus has saved us, and he's washed us. Titus 3, verses 4 through 8. Titus 3, verses 4 through 8. Titus 3, verses 4 through 8. It says, But when the kindness of the love of God, our Savior, toward man, appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to, listen, I want you to affirm constantly that those who believe in God should be careful to maintain good works, these things are good and profitable to men. And so I love that in verse 8 where Paul is saying to Titus, you need to affirm these things constantly. To know these things. You need to know these things. Affirm them constantly. Jesus has saved us through the washing and the regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. He poured himself out and it's We've received abundant grace through Jesus Christ our Savior. Because of that, we're justified by grace through faith. Our sin has been washed away. And we need to know these things, affirm these things. Could we need to confirm and or affirm these things in our hearts this morning? That Jesus did pour himself out, that it was enough. And because we believe that we have been washed, past tense, it's already been done, it's finished, he said. And you and I, those that believe on Jesus, all of our sins have been washed away. We've been justified. 
It's just I've never sinned, right? But like Peter, our feet are dirty. And the things that we should not have walked in, we've walked in. And Peter says, man, my head and my hands, right, my arms, wash me, all my whole body. Our head, yeah, we've thought things that we shouldn't have thought. Our hands, we've touched things that we shouldn't have touched. We see our sin, we know our sin, just like Peter. But Jesus would tell us this morning, just like he told Peter, he said, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. So you and I, we're in the process of sanctification. If you're born again, you've been washed clean, you're justified, you're saved. But now, we're in this process of sanctification. The Bible says that he's faithful to complete the work that he began in you. Right? That he's began a work, and he's going to complete it. In 1 John 1, 8 and 9, you guys know that verse, starting in 8. It says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we have to, where it says, verse 9, we confess our sin. Yeah, I'm born again. I'm saved. I'm washed clean. But I'm still walking around in this world that's upside down. And I'm, I get dirty. But I confess my sin, which means I agree. I agree with you, Lord. As soon as I'm walking with you and I'm hanging out with you, we are in this amazing, awesome fellowship. And then I sin because of temptation. I fall because of temptation. I walk into things or touch things or think things or do things that I shouldn't do. But instantly I go to God and I say, God, I agree. I am a sinner. And I remember that he says, I'm already forgiven. And so I come and I confess my sin. And he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it's kind of interesting because we're looking at it from God's point of view. If you look at it from his point of view, you're already forgiven yesterday, today, and forever. If we're looking at it from our point of view, we see that if I sin right now, I'm in sin. But God knows, and he knows the future, and he sees that you are in sin, but he's chosen to forget it. He sees you as righteous because of the blood of Jesus, his son. But for us, we have to remember and grasp and say, I need to confess my sin. I need to agree immediately. And the reason why is because I'm causing a separation. Yeah, I'm saved, but I'm causing a separation between me and my father. So we have to agree to confess, to be washed daily, not for salvation. I mean, you, don't be, you don't need a holy bath again, you know, Jesus is saying. But to keep this intimacy with God, this fellowship with God, Jesus says, you have to let me wash your feet, Peter. In verse 11, it says, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. This is amazing because Jesus still washed Jesus' feet. And this is the, the, one of the last things he's going to do before he goes to the cross. And so a lot of people, they can actually go through an experience or a ritual or a religion. Jesus, Jesus did wash his feet, but his soul was not changed, right? Judas did not experience what the twelve experienced. He didn't confess his sin. And he didn't believe, right? He didn't turn to Jesus. He was a betrayer. So when he had washed their feet, even Jesus, he had taken his garments, he sat down again, and he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? Because he wants to know that they know. Think about it. Do you know what I've done? You need to know what I've done in your life. And remember that. And walk differently because of that, because it's what you believe to be true. You know it's true. You need to affirm these things. And so in verse 12, when it says he took his garments, so Jesus, we know he rose again, right? He took his garments, he put on flesh again. And what did he do? He went up to heaven and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of the Father, which is where he was at now. 
Jesus is resurrected, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne. And in the next few verses, Jesus is going to be leading by example. So verses 4 through 6, Jesus illustrated for us salvation. And then Jesus, in 6 through 12, displayed justification and sanctification as he washed our people. And then in 13 through 17, which we're going to cover now, we see Jesus leading by example. He says, 13, you call me teacher and Lord. And you say, well, for I am. Like, good job. But I think it's interesting here because he does change it up, though. In the next verse, in 14, he says, If I then, your Lord and teacher, he flipped him, right? So he's, in a way, he's saying, yeah, I am the teacher and I am your Lord. But first, I'm Lord, right? He says, if I then, your Lord and teacher. Jesus has to be first your Lord. You have to surrender all to him. And then he can be your teacher. But if you're just taking in information, but he's not your Lord, then you're truly, like Judas, you're not going to get your feet washed, right? Or if you're saved, you can be saved and get caught up in, yeah, you know the word of God, you've read it so many times, but are you doing it? Right? And then maybe you're just far from God because the sanctification process is being interrupted. And it's not saying that you're lost, that you lost, you don't lose your salvation. But you lose that fellowship with God. But Jesus tells them, If then I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also to wash one another's feet. So this is the example of how you know you've really been washed. And if you're walking in fellowship with God, we're to be washing one another's feet. We're to be humbling ourselves and looking for opportunities to love people, looking for an opportunity to lift people up. The world is telling you to look for opportunity to step on them and climb up above them, right? <laughs> that you can take their job, or that you can make what they're making. Or, and, the, and Jesus is saying, love, like I did. I put, I put you first. I became the servant. I laid down. I, the one who was rich became poor, right? The, the poor could become rich. He says in 16, Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. And if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them now, right? If you do them, verse 17. If you know these things, blessed are you. Then <laughs> if you do them, it's not enough just to know it. And that's where it can be tricky for Christians that have been walking with God because we know it, but are we doing it? And if we're not doing it, it's probably because we're not confessing. And if I have to confess every time that moment where I feel that separation, where I know that I have sinned, I'm going to constantly be in prayer. I'm going to constantly be asking forgiveness, constantly confessing my sin. How in the world is that? Well, that's what you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> Constantly praying. Praying without ceasing. Right? Confessing your sin. Living in that place. Of saying, God, you're God. I'm not. I'm a sinner. And, but I remember what you've done for me. And will you just wash me? Will you just wash my feet, Lord? Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, if there's a position in the church where the worker will have to toil hard and get no thanks for it, take it and be blessed with it. If you can perform a service which few will ever seek to do themselves or appreciate when performed by others, yet occupy it with holy delight, covet humble work, and when you get it, be content to continue in it. There's no great rush after the lowest places. You will rob no one by seeking them. Wow. To be the greatest is to be the servant of all. James and John were fighting right over who would be the greatest. And in Mark 10, verse 42, this is what it says. Jesus speaking. 
He says, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them. Jesus is saying, they lord over them. And the great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. James, John, all you guys, everybody here, every believer. It's not to be like that. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. Whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And so, we just need to remember. Is it time for a pedicure? <laughs> you know? When you, they walked around them, the animals were everywhere. Cows and donkeys and camels. And so it wasn't really a pretty picture probably at the Last Supper think about the things that were going on in the hearts of the disciples and the heart of one of the disciples, you know, and then also what was happening to Jesus as he was truly starting to feel sorrow deep in his heart from what he was going to experience. But yet he still humbled himself and washed their feet. And we're going to step in it, right? We're going to step in it. But that's okay. Just come to Jesus. Confess your sin. Right? I'll forgive you from all unrighteousness. Dear Lord, we love you. We praise you. God, I thank you that your death was enough. I pray, God, that you would affirm that in our hearts, Lord. That we would allow that to just be ingrained into our hearts, God, knowing that that's truth. God, that we have been born again, washed new, regenerated by the washing of the word. New creatures in Christ, all things have been made new. Lord, our heart is to follow and serve you, Lord. But if our fellowship's been interrupted, God, we pray. God, remind us what it's like to be sensitive to your spirit. In that very moment, God, when we go to sin, that we would hear you say, no, I love you. Follow me. Choose me. God, that we would say, yes, I agree, Lord. I'm a sinner. I agree. Forgive me. <clears throat> Hopefully, we'll say that before we sin, God. But if we don't, we're going to say that as soon as we do sin, and ask for your forgiveness and confess our sin to you, Lord. I pray, Jesus, that you wash our feet this morning. I pray if anybody doesn't know you, God, Lord Jesus, they need a bath. I pray that they would come to know you, God, as through faith, by believing. God, I pray that you would minister to them in their heart, that all they need to do is come and turn and say, I'm a sinner. Confess their sin before you, Lord, and believe that your death was enough, that you rose again from the dead, that you had to do it. You're the only one, but you said it's finished, God. You completed the work. And so, God, we just pray for those that maybe you just pray that prayer, God. Affirm that in their hearts. Help them get plugged in. And Lord, for us that just need to be washed in you, God, remind us, Lord. Remind us that we'd be in prayer without ceasing, Lord. That we would never let that fellowship break. We love you, God. We praise you. In Jesus' name.